setting you up for success is the ultimate goal. So when you go out there and you're fishing these bridges, these are pretty hardcore conditions. So you better bring some hardcore gear. So tell us about what we have here. So what we normally use for throwing flare hawks and different jigs from the top of these bridges for snook tarpon and grouper is on the heavier side, um, you're looking something between seven foot, eight foot, um, anywhere between 20 to 50 pound rated. If you're if you're really fishing some heavy stuff, you know, if you're trying to go for goliaths and tarpon, you know, you might want to move up into the uh, 50 to 100 rated rods and, you know, people use the 65 to 200 rated to res all the time as well. Um, reel selection, it, it all depends on what you're doing. If you're really finesse fishing with the smaller jigs and, and, and smaller flare hawks from the top of these bridges, you're going to want to use like a 6,000. If you're going into the heavier stuff or if you're throwing live ladyfish, live grunts, off the top of bridges you want to move up to an 8,000 to a 10,000 size reel and that's because you really need the drag capacity to pull these fish out of the pilings and not really giving them an inch to run because if you're hooking this fish five inches away from the piling if you give him five inches he's in the piling and he's going to break you off so you really have to stop these fish you're looking for anywhere between 15 to 25 pounds of drag you now a lot of people disagree with me there and say let them let them play and stuff but you know you're not hooking 40 inch snook on 100 pound leader two two feet away from a fender so i th you know and i agree with you on that so one of the things that i found uh is that fishing offshore for grouper and inshore for grouper are two different ball games now they're going to strike they're going to slam they're going to hit you with all their fury but inshore for sure that fight is literally won right there in the first couple seconds if you don't yank that thing out right now then you've lost and you're going to lose a four dollar jig you're going to lose terminal tackle in any and situation most importantly you're going to lose the fish and that's the biggest thing we don't want to do here that's like my biggest pet peeve is losing fish you know when i'm up on the bridge i spend all this time every single night i'm out there all night for hours you know i'm not going to work i'm not going to class i'm not getting any sleep i'm literally <laughs> throwing my life away to catch these fish and for me to lose them because I'm not using the right tackle, you know, it's it's the most ridiculous thing to me. So that's why when I go up there, you know, I'm using 60 to 100 pound leader. I'm using the 20 to 40 rated rods with extra heavy power and fast action on them. Like, I'm literally ripping these fish in a tug of war away from their homes. You have no choice. Like when you're fishing from a boat, you're out on a flat, letting them run, letting them play with the drag, that's all fine and dandy. But when you're playing in structure for, for big fish, for prize fish, um, drag is on lock. Uh, there, there's really no two ways about it. Um, when you're yanking those grouper out of those those structure points, drag on lock, that's all, that's all there is to yeah, it. And no. you better be sure that your gear is gonna hold up this isn't your your Shakespeare Tiger seventeen dollar combo. It's not. It's not going to cut it. Um, you may you may get lucky. You may pull three, four, ten out. But one day that thing is going to fail, and then you're going to be twice as upset because not only did you lose that fish, but now you're going home because <laughs> now you don't have any gear to fish with. So now, I mean, it's toast. So exactly. you know your your total catch um, is going to be. Uh, and, and part a reflection of the gear that you bring. So you better bring the right tools for the job. So in this segment, what we're talking about specifically is not just fishing for bridges, but more specifically fishing for grouper. So when you're digging on the bottom, drag on lock, bring your game. Yeah, and what we call it on the top of the bridges is hammer down drag. You know, you have that thing all the way hammered down so you cannot turn it anymore. You can't pull any drag out and you know, if a fish starts pulling drag and you're hammered down, you're in for a ride. <laughs> <laughs> so like, I've had that happen a couple times where I hook into you know a snook from hell and it starts pulling drag and I'm like, dude, I got like 20 pounds of drag locked down. I don't, I don't know what this is. And usually it'll end up to be you know gigantic snook or a, a big tarpon or something like that. Or a huge disappointment if your gear fails, your knot fails, or they get to the structure before you can edit the fight. And that's something really I, I really wanted to talk about. You know, any. I just want to say this to you guys very clearly. Anytime you're fighting a fish, something has to fail. Whether it be your rod, your reel, your line, your leader, your knot, or the fish. The whole goal is to beat the fish, not your gear. 
So if you have any imperfection in your gear, if your rod isn't rated strong enough, if your reel doesn't have enough drag capacity, if your line isn't strong enough, if your knots aren't on point, if your hook, if you're using a cheap hook that's gonna bend out, that's what's gonna fail and that fish is gonna get away. Bend or break. Yeah. Frayed leader, forget about it. Waste the, and it's not really wasted time. Spend that couple minutes, especially if you're using these more advanced knot techniques, spend those couple minutes Put, you know, if you're fishing at night, turn on the headlamp, get yourself set up, get the knot set up, because if your gear fails, your feelings are going to be so <laughs> hurt. hurt, so hurt. You know, uh, it's one thing if, you know, you're out there and you're having fun, you're catching jacks or you're catching ladyfish or what have you, and, and they, they, they spit the hook. That's no big deal. But when you got the big one on you, you know that that thing's about to be in the fryer or make a great Instagram photo and your gear fails, <laughs> your, your feelings are going to be hurt. Hopefully yeah. you have tissues in your tackle and bag. I, I really can't reiterate this enough. When you're out on these bridges, you're putting in so much time, money, effort into catching these fish. These, the, the fish you're chasing on a bridge isn't your average 25 to 30 inch snook. You're targeting 40 plus inch snook. You're targeting 150 to 200 pound tarpon. You're, you're tar targeting every fish at the top of its class. You're targeting trophies. So when you're out there, you know, you might only catch one quality fish over the course of five fishing trips or six fishing trips, but that one fish makes it worth it. And to lose that one fish, it's the most heartbreaking <laughs> experience that you can ever go through. So I just want to spare you all from that feeling. Get the right gear, you know, get the right rod, get the right reel, tie your knots, double tie them, triple tie them, then tie them again, make sure they're right. So this is a typical setup that we use on top of the bridges when we're uh, fishing with jigs and fishing for snook, tarpon, and grouper. This is a seven foot bull bay, 20 to 40 pound rated brute force rod. It's a fast action and heavy power, which really gives you that strength to really pull these fish out from behind the pilings and, and out of these fenders. Then we have that paired with a 6,000 Saragossa made by Shimano. No, this is the old school one, but it has 27 pounds of drag. No, that's definitely enough power to really get these fish out from underneath. <laughs> I would certainly hope so. And uh, line that we're using, we're using 50 pound Suffix 832 braid. Um, you know, really the breaking strength on this braid is, I think it's rated at what, 86 pounds. So you really can pull just about any fish in. This rig is normally made for popping and jigging for tuna and wahoo offshore. What we're using it for, you know, it's not a, its intended purpose. So breaking the rules. Yeah, we gotta break them. There are no, there are no standard unless you're using heavy conventional gear, right? And the problem there is you're not gonna get any casting distance. You can't sit <laughs> sit yeah. there with a with a big four out and and get good distance. You and know, I'm sure I'm jig. sure there's some old guy down at Skyway that can you know cast a four out like nobody else, but <laughs> for most of us. <laughs> There's something really comfortable too about using spinning gear in general for me. Um, yeah. I can definitely use conventional gear and there's plenty of places for that. I use it a lot for, for shark fishing and for fishing offshore and digging, off, especially digging offshore. Um, I like to use spinning gear for, for more upper water column fishing, fishing for jacks and stuff like that, jigging. But uh, you know this is this is comfortable it's not overly heavy you can cast it all day long and you shouldn't have that level of of difficulty it's the it's the delicate balance between using super heavy gear and super light tackle it's, exactly it's pitchable it's repeatable it's it's accurate and the thing is you really have to to go with What's comfortable for you you know personally i like a little bit heavier setups you know i'm normally out there with a 50 to 100 um, shimano therese with a 8000 shimano twin power with 52 pounds of drag but you know that's because sometimes i'm out there throwing a 25 inch ladyfish down or a you know 15 inch mullet or it could be a j it you know it's really versatile and it still has the the strength behind it to to do whatever I need to do with it. You know, some others like my friend Chris Wynn out there on the on uh, on the bridges down in Sarasota. He's normally throwing a 
30 to 65 rated or a 50 to 100 rated talus, which is a little bit lighter rod. Um, I mean, he's using a 6,000 sustain, which is more of a finesse reel. He wants to keep more in contact with his jig. Uh, he uses a lot of lighter weights. I'm usually throwing the two ounces, he's usually throwing the 1.5. So it's really what's comfortable for you, um, you know, in the style of fishing that you do in the areas that you're fishing in. If you're fishing Sebastian Inlet in, you know, 30 to 40 feet of water with a, a crazy current with three ounce jigs, you know, you're gonna wanna beef up your setup a little bit, get that 8,000 or 10,000 size reel, get that eight foot rod, you know, you're looking at your Vanstall 250s, Vanstall 200s and stuff like that, um, you know, and if you're fishing Courtney Campbell under the bridges over there and 10 to 12 feet of water when there's really not too much current to worry about, you know, you could get away with the, the 15 to 25 pound, you know, seven foot six rods, seven foot rods, you know, working with one ounce flare hogs, 1.25 and, and stuff like that. Not only are we throwing jigs from the top of bridges for gags, we're also using natural bait and a lot of different natural bait presentations. Um, one of my favorite ways to catch these fish is throwing a big weight with a big bait down on the bottom. Um, that's usually whether it be a chopped ladyfish, you know, chunked of a grunt, big thread fin, big greenback, whatever. This is the setup that I'm going to be using. You know, I'm usually using a six to eight ounce weight to really keep that on the bottom and these heavy currents under these bridges or, or at, whether I'm in an inlet or a canal. Um, usually fishing a lot of heavy currents, so I want a very heavy weight to be able to support that. I have a six foot, 30 to 80 pound grouper digging rod. Um, you know, it's meant to, to be fishing offshore. I use it from the bridges because you really have to put that stopping power on that fish. As soon as you hook them, you have to pull them out of the pilings, you have to pull them out of the fenders, or you're, you're pretty much going to lose it. So, uh, for the real selection here, what I prefer to use is a two speed, just in case I really have some trouble with the fish, I get to drop down into a three to one gear ratio, and that really can put the power on that fish and really get them away from the piling in a, in a, in a quick fashion. You're not gonna gain too much line on them, but at the very least, you're gonna gain line. Um, and with that, I'm using 80 pound braid. A lot of people use 100 to 120 pound braid. I think that's a little bit overkill. 80 is really all you need. I'm usually throwing on a 100 pound fluorocarbon or mono leader to it. Um, you know, you, you really want heavy enough line because at, at some point you're going to be rubbing up against those bridge pilings. That fish will get you into the fenders and you're going to have to play a tug of war to really try to get him out. And you don't want your line to fail while you're trying to do that. You know, a lot of times I'll bring, you know, there's barely any braid on this reel right now. You know why that is? Is because a lot of the times these fish will wrap me up into the pilings and have my braid all frayed up on the pilings. And I have to tug of war, pull them out and I come up and all my lines frayed and I have to cut it. You know, and it just is what it is. But thank God that I have heavy enough line that you get to land the fish afterwards. That's that's the biggest thing. You want to be able to land that fish, no matter if he gets you in the pilings, no matter if he beats you around the piling, um, no matter if he beats you around the fender. You want to be able to land that fish. That's why you need the heaviest line possible that you could use, the heaviest leader possible that you could use, so you could have that uh, abrasion resistance that 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 you're really looking for. You're breaking a lot of rules, and that's one of the things that you're stepping outside the norm of traditional. You know <coughs> what your pappy taught you, and so what pappy taught you was you know as light a line as possible for the situation uh light leader you know let them let them run some drag let them wear themselves out but like none of those things apply here and so what i like about this setup here is this is like having multiple setups in one it's super versatile you can run this thing offshore this thing's going to work just great inshore and the cool thing about the two speed and if you're not familiar with a setup like that You've got the option to either run it in a high speed, low torque or a high torque, low speed setup. So if you're, you can take this thing, you can be out fishing for, for snapper and pretty much using it like a lighter tackle rig. And if you really need to turn on the balls, well then you drop it down into low gear and that thing is in dig mode. And so these things will cost you a little more than a standard conventional, but really it's, it's literally like buying two reels at once. So just keep that in mind when you're doing this. Um, a lot of times, me personally, if I was grouper digging, knew that I was grouper digging, I'm gonna be in low speed the whole time because I just want all torque all the time. I don't want to give the fish any advantages. He's talking about line weight and, and really maxing that out because you're cheating. You're not following those traditional rules. You, ha you have to. There is no choice. It's it's literally you're trying to cheat the system. You you have like, to. You, you're no not choice. fighting a fish like anybody else fights fish. 
Um, out on the bridges, you don't have the opportunity to let that fish play. You don't have the opportunity to have a fight with the fish. It's either you win or you lose, and that gets decided within the first three seconds of the fight. Sure. It's either that fish beats you or you beat him. If you get him out of the pilings, congratulations, you're about to land that fish. If he beats you into the pilings, congratulations, you just lost that fish. Yeah, and I mean, the fight is still there. Even after you, you get, you know, you're still fighting a big fish. Um, and so don't, let's mm -hmm. not get that mixed up. But I do want to, and this is something that we're really trying to drive home here. If you give them one second, it's over. It is over. You better be paying attention. No sitting your rod down, checking Instagram, seeing the cute girls on Snapchat, checking out the newest filters because you're going to lose gonna, right away. You will lose. You're going to get burnt. And that's like the biggest thing we say on the bridge, don't get burnt. It will happen to you. If you're fishing on the bridges, if you're putting the time in, you're using the right rigs, you're using the right baits and the right lures, you're going to get hit by some very big fish. And if you're not ready for it, they're going to take your equipment with them. They're going to break you off. They're going to take your line. They're going to break your reel. They're going to break your rod over the over the bridge pilings. You know, these fish are not playing. You know, it's you know, a lot of people say, you know, it's just bridge fishing or you're just inshore fishing. You know, how hard can it be? It's it's similar to when you're out there fighting a marlin or you're fighting a big, you know, blue fin tuna or yellow fin tuna. You have to have these gigantic reels or they will break your equipment because you have to be able to stop these fish. And it's the same thing inshore. You can't use your normal inshore equipment. You have to be able to stop these fish. So you have to go out with your your bigger offshore um, combos, your your larger popping and jigging and um you know larger offshore setups that a lot of people are normally using for tuna and wahoo and mahi offshore you got to bring it into a bridge you know <laughs> two miles away from your house nowhere near offshore and you know 30 feet of water because it's hell eight feet of water i mean and that's what's crazy about fishing inshore a lot of a lot of people had a hard time that i spoke to have a hard time wrapping their head around that and maybe that's why the group of fishing has been so good you know maybe not everybody is hip these things are not in just a hundred feet they're not just in 50 or 30. i mean i find these things around docks and, and literally six feet around some of the bridges that i fish for gags i have seen gags on flats in about two feet of water looking like redfish yeah i i swear you know one day i was looking down and i see them like you know that's a weird looking trout right there Maybe that's a redfish. Man, that's the fattest redfish I've ever seen in my life. You throw a little flare hawk in front of me, he comes out and hits it. Next thing you pull it up, it's like a little 20 inch gag. I could not believe it. Out on the flat. You know, these. And honestly, that's actually a known fact. It's not even really a surprise. That is where they go to spawn. Keep that a secret, though. And so, <clears throat> it's funny, here you are. You're literally, you know. In, in the in the medium case scenario right you definitely are, are going out here to catch trophies but what's really going to happen is you're really going to be catching some five to eight pound fish and here you are fishing 80 100 pound you know it, but it's like that and, and take the word on it that it's like that my fishing mentor the first time i ever saw him catch an inshore grouper when he was schooling me on some of the techniques he would, we would go to this spot, the rail's about chest high, and he'd be sitting on top of it, leg over it, locked in, get his bait set, and then when he would, he would step back over to our side of the rail, but still be standing up, and then as soon as that thing struck, he would run away, pew, gone like the roadrunner. And I and thought it was the silliest looking thing. Dude, dude, you look stupid. But he landed those fish at such a high percentage because why? He got them out of their comfort zone right away. And after that, now you're now you're just fighting a fish. But what you don't want to do, and what we're ultimately trying to help you avoid, is fighting rocks because you're going to lose, and that's right where they're headed. Yeah. So that's that's one of the main. It's not the fish himself. He's strong. He's a good fight, like any other you know big fish in that weight size. But what the difference is is where he's going, and you won't be that. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like I said before. This battle is won within the first three seconds of the fight. It's either you turn that fish or he's got you in a piling and you're in a really tough situation. <clears throat> you know, if you get that fish out into the open, you know, you're still going to have to deal with fray. You're still going to have to deal with that fish running around. And if he's big enough, he's probably going to be pulling drag even with your slam down with your 50 pounds of drag. Um, at the end of the day, 
you have to get him out of the pilings. If he goes into the pilings, your chances of landing that fish go very, 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 very. Yeah, small, they start right? to they start to go down. The yeah, you're, for yeah, sure. exactly. And you know the biggest thing there is a technique to fighting him, and I'd love to to show him out on the bridge. You know what that looks like when you hook into a fish right next to a piling. You have to run to the opposite side and keep him out of the pilings because that that really is a big big part of it.